And now to Eddie Aruza and an out of this world guest. Eddie. Becoming one of the best known scientists in America and quite possibly the universe takes more than just smarts. It also requires charisma and a keen sense of how to communicate complex concepts in ways that most anyone can understand them. A few decades ago, Carl Sagan was that scientist, and Sagan played a key role in shaping the man who now carries on his legacy. If life has a sanctuary, it's here in the nucleus, which contains our DNA. That, of course, is astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's the director of the Hayden Planetarium at the Rose Center for Earth and Space in New York City. And Dr. T Tyson joins us now. Welcome. Well, thank, thanks for what having me. What a thrill to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. And we should mention that the big reason that you're in Chicago and visiting us is that you're receiving a major prize from the Lincoln uh, Presidential Library Foundation. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit about well, that? Well, the Lincoln Leadership Prize. And, you know, they gave me the phone call, and it actually was an email. And a leadership prize, Lincoln. I don't know what. I'm just a scientist. What are you talking about? You looked at the previous people who have won it, and there are no scientists there. There are people who have shaped our world in very important and positive ways. So I, I was wondering whether they sent the email to the wrong person. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's for continuing <clears throat> the president's legacy, President Lincoln's well, legacy. Well, yes. So if you go back to President Lincoln's legacy, there's more than just you know gluing the country back together. There, was, there are pieces of it that I think don't get talked about much because it's overshadowed by so much of else about his life that we remember. So uh, in 1862, he created the land-grant college system. Oh my gosh, this, was, this enabled people to become educated that wouldn't otherwise have access, and it sort of birthed modern agriculture in the United States. And then a year later, he would sign into, into law the creation of the National Academy of Sciences. This is 1863. This man had some other important stuff to be thinking about <laughs> in 1863, which is the year of his the Gettysburg Address, of course. But in there, he founds an agency that he tasks with the, uh, the role of advising the President and Congress on emergent scientific issues so that they can make the best decisions they can in the interest of and the of nation. And of course, that's something that you have done. Well, so, yes, yeah, so I've advised presidents um, not solely, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, what should I do in this case? Among the advisors. <laughs> yeah, no, I served on, on several advisory panels and, and committees and, and commissions. Uh, but so it's, it's, it's a noble cause, I mean, because you're taking time away from your own lab or your own work in the service of the country. And, and I felt very patriotic when called for that. They said, they need me, they want me. They, and and so, so you then... You kind of rise up above politics at that point, mm -hmm. and you say, there's a bigger issue that needs to be addressed here, and that is the accurate representation of what science is and how and why it works, and how that can be reached for and tapped for sensible policy. And so, so when I look back on what I had actually done, I said, okay, somebody was paying attention to my profile, to my my portfolio of activities, and so I said, I, I, so I gladly uh, accepted the, uh, agreed to accept the award. I'm in Chicago today for just that purpose. To get it. Well, congratulations. Thank it's you. It's good to have you here. And when you talk about accuracy and accurate representation of science, of course, that's something that you have made your mission to and sometimes struggle in the face of a lot of opposition. So, so how would you describe what you do in terms of keeping science relevant and understandable? Yeah, uh, it's not so much a mission statement as it is I'm much more reactive than proactive in this regard. So if a movie comes out and it claims to have accurate science, I might tweet, no, you got that one wrong. <laughs> I might just, just keep them honest mm -hmm. about it. And if, if the directors or writers or, or screenwriters are, are good, they will respond to that level of, inc uh, of, of comment and maybe adjust it for their next movie or think about it or, or bring on an expert on set. Um, if there's something going on nationally or internationally that is missing some science insights, I'll, I might tweet what how that could be enhanced. But my primary, the primary thing I do is just get people thinking about the role of science in our lives. And it's bigger than ever before. So, so without it, I mean, you can't have an informed democracy in the 21st century. You have people walking around not understanding what science is or how and why it works. That is not, that is not how, I, that, no. 
you, you, <laughs> you, as, as, as you well know, there's a lot of skeptics out there, and it ranges from this whole flat Earth movement. Oh, that, you know, you uh, won't call those skeptics. They're, well, they're, they're, they're deniers. deniers. Yeah, they're complete deniers. No, a skeptic is someone who can respond to evidence. You say, I'm not sure about that. Do you have better evidence or different evidence? Yeah, here it is. Oh, okay. Now let's go on to the next problem. That's the skeptic. But someone who is flat in denial because they don't understand how to understand, they're not skeptics. They are some other species of, of brain wiring that, that I don't, and, and that, and I don't go around blaming any of those people. We all come out of an educational system that somehow allows there to be walking, talking adults that think that way. And I'm thinking the problem is way deeper than just who's running around thinking the earth is flat. You're ter talking about education, but also social media is, is a very powerful force, and you use it uh, v very well. You use it brilliantly, and it's a lot of fun sometimes. Sometimes it's, it's critical, as you mentioned. But when you have the Flat Earth people and pushback from creationists, which you received when you did the latest version of Cosmos, oh, yes, and even today the new EPA chief is questioning whether carbon dioxide really is the key contributing factor to climate change. How do, you, how do you counter that? Yeah, it's so, like, what I try to do is, uh, now, by the way, there are other people who try to correct every misstatement that's out there. That's not me. What I try to do is empower people to rethink what it is that they think is true. I'm in, I want to empower you. So in tweets, if you look at the tweets I've posted over the years, they're just, they're, they're, their perspectives that you might not have had before. So you know, if you look at it this way, look what happens. Have you considered this problem in this light? Have you rethought this in this way? And when you do that, you're, it's empowering. It's, it's, wow, I never thought about it that way. Well, let me go back to these other things in my life and see if I still think the same way about them. That's really what I try to do. Otherwise, you just spend your life chasing after people, hitting them on the head, and that's not, uh, as an educator, I, I don't feel comfortable. Yeah, it's a whack-a-mole, and I, a great, perfect example. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you, what arcades do you spend thank your time you. in? I, I get approval from Neil deGrasse Tyson, that's good. When you're talking about being empowered and knowledgeable. Intellectually empowered. Intellectually empowered, we have to give a lot of kudos to Cyril, Cyril and Sunchita, your parents. Oh, well, my who, parents, yeah, yeah, they, um, they, in my household, they, they raised me, my sister and I, as um, with, I think, the respect of requiring an argument if they needed to get us to do something. And we're looking at that photograph of oh, you oh, and your me. father. Oh, that's me. That's my very first telescope. Uh, your my father, father who, helping you put who, together? Who passed this past uh, Sadly December. Sadly passed, yes. Yeah. I mean, he was 89. I mean, he, it's, so yeah, helping me put together, my, that was the tripod of that first telescope. Uh, I, I, that might have been my 12th birthday at the time. Uh, the, so if they say, we need you to do this, we would ask why, and they would then give the reason. Not because I'm your dad, therefore you must do it. I've been in a lot of households and that's the, dyna the dynamic that's going on. Mm -hmm. If the dynamic is do it because I say so, do it because I'm the adult and you're the child, that does not foster curiosity. That fosters obedience. And you cannot have any kind of discovery in this world if your brain is wired for obedience to someone who came before you, who, who, who was trained by someone who came before them. How do you invent tomorrow if you have to obey everything that someone who knows less about tomorrow than you will after they die, if you gotta obey everything that they say? So our household um, fostered, it, it, fostered it, that, uh, continued to stimulate the curiosity that is inborn into every child who's out there. And you faced a, um, a lot of struggles growing up, especially there at PS81 in New York City in the Bronx, uh, because of the color of your skin and your heritage, wasn't that right? Well, I, don't, I, I didn't think of them as struggles so much as, well, it just was life, you know? When you're a kid, everything around you is what is normal, right? And there it, we see you as a young man uh, where you were also a jock. Uh, yeah, way, yeah, yeah, I was pretty good. I, was, I could slam dunk a basketball <laughs> in ninth grade. I could jump high and, and can hold it. But so there, there were stereotypes, of course, that, that pervaded, especially back then in the 1960s and 1970s, because that's how old I am. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 my vision was on the universe. So all this other stuff was just, uh, you know, it was occasionally in the way, but I just step over it, step around it, dig under it, because my, my vision statement was written very early. 
I mean, I, with that telescope, I'm 12 years old, but I knew since my first visit to a planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium the Hayden in New planetarium, York City, yes. where I now serve as director. Uh, There's the old Hayden, by the way. Oh, the old Hayden, yeah, yeah. Where you went as a nine-year-old, and it transformed your life. And uh, It could transform everybody's life. We all remember, you, uh, we just met, and I'm sure you remember your first day in a planetarium. I do, and as we were talking before we started this segment, unless the first you're on a date and you were smooching in the back row, <laughs> me, uh, I looked up at the sky somehow. And and there's the brand new yeah, facility, relatively brand new, that you uh, were instrumental in in getting uh, uh, built. And oh yeah, yeah, a couple of our planets hanging, not Pluto. Yeah. No, well, I know you and my crowd are, are don't, don't get me about started. Pluto. But let me ask you, in in between that That's old the Rose Center for Earth and Space, and my office is right. Can you see it? That window right there. You're waving, aren't you? You're waving out the window. Uh, in, in between the old planetarium and the new one, Carl Sagan did uh, have factored into your life in a chance meeting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. So, as well, I mean, I... I <laughs> this was when you were 17, Yeah, I was 17. Right? I was applying to college. And uh, I applied... One of the colleges I applied to was Cornell. And then I was admitted. But unknown to me, the admissions office uh, forwarded my application to Carl Sagan, who was on the faculty at Cornell at the time, uh, seeing if he would sort of help like recruit me now that I had been admitted. And I, he sent me a personal letters, like hand signed. And I'd never met him. He doesn't know me from anything. And he was already famous, hadn't done Cosmos yet, but he was on The Tonight Show, mm -hmm. the best selling books. So this is like a really famous person reaching out to a 17 year old kid, inviting me to campus, and he'd give me a private tour. I said, yeah, okay, that's what I'll do. <laughs> so I took a bus up to Ithaca, New York. He, you know, they, I, I, he came and greeted me outside of his building. He, the, there he goes for the original Cosmos. Yeah. Uh, he um, gave me a tour of the lab, pulled a book out from behind him, which was one of his books, signed it to me. I still have that book. Uh, it begins to snow. He drives me back to the bus station. He says, if, this, if the bus can't get through, here's my home phone number. Call me, you can spend the night with my family, and maybe you can leave tomorrow if necessary. And, I, and to this day, I think, if, I remember thinking at age 17, if I'm ever remotely that famous, then I must treat a next generation of students the way he treated me. And that shaped how I interact with the public and especially with students. I, Barack could be on the phone. I said, but I got a student at the door. I'll call you back. Put, a, okay? put the president on the yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's great that you have assumed that mantle of Carl Sagan and you are uh, joining us to talk about this. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more because I have so many more questions to ask you and we're going to continue online. But it's a pleasure having you here in Chicago okay, and on thanks, our show, thanks Dr. Tyson. Me. Thanks so much. And Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to stay with us for just a few more minutes to continue our conversation online. And you can see that part of our conversation on our website. For now, there's a lot more Chicago Tonight ahead, so stay with us.